Hello and welcome to the Niner Nine podcast. It is Niall and Andrea Cleary here. Our roving reporter, Andrea Cleary, is in the building, <laughs> in the virtual building, podcast building. <laughs> How are you? <laughs> I'm hot. I'm very Lovely. warm. Yes, uh, it is warm, everybody. You're feeling it. I'm feeling it. You are feeling it through the headphones, I'm sure. Uh, it's also hard to wear headphones when it's you're hot. Being, it's hot like this. It's hot. I was on two buses today and I sat on the sunny side of the bus both times because the shady side of the bus was all taken up and I thought I was going to melt. melt. Absolute melter. It was horrendous. Yeah. But anyway. Yeah, that was me. We'll, we'll maybe talk about hot gig, maybe not... Uh, hot stuff that's happening but uh yeah this episode we're going to be talking about andrea goes to slain this is the andrea goes to slain episode <laughs> uh, and a few other bits too so um i have been sure. i was away last week uh, hence no podcast and uh had a lovely time in santorini and have loads of tips for anyone who wants to go to santorini a great place one of those great adult playground kind of um lovely natural places to go have a holiday if you want to sit on a beach you can if you want to explore towns you can lovely 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 10 out of 10 for me uh feeling good um came back to this absolutely sweltering <laughs> heat great okay but what about you what about <laughs> you i know there was a lot of lead up in terms of uh, what was coming on and what was happening with slain i know you don't go to a lot of big gigs so you, no. you apl- kind of applied <laughs> your um, journalistic principles to the uh, pre preparation and preview of Harry Styles at Slane Castle. So tell me, where do you start? Where do you start? Where you, you, you did a couple of articles, first of all, on, I your, guess. on your Substack. Yes, I did. Um, Slane was announced back, you know, last year and it was Harry Styles and myself and my friend Nadia basically like became friends because she introduced me to or like One Direction was a big part of our sort of like early friendship. So we were like, we have to go. So we got our tickets, uh, Gen Pop tickets, 97 quid each. It's not cheap, but we we did it. <laughs> and um, and I honestly bought them just like not thinking about the fact that it was slain. Like, obviously, I knew it was going to be slain. I knew what slain meant in terms of like the legacy of it here in this country hadn't been and before. its place. No, never been before. I'd seen footage of like, like I've seen pictures of Queen playing. I've seen footage of Robbie. And anytime I've ever looked at footage like that, I've thought, well, that looks like a nightmare. <laughs> <laughs> that looks horrendous. And like, you couldn't pay me enough money to be in the middle of all that. And yet, um harry styles comes along and i decide yeah to i'll do go it to slain <laughs> but like i said not really thinking about yeah. like the size of the crowd like nothing like that was just so tunnel vision towards being in the same area as harry styles um you've you've yeah been so slain, i was gonna right? I'll, I'll tell you what the gigs were later but um i was there in 1998 when i was 16 and in 2001 mm. I think they're the right years to go to Slane. I certainly would take me a lot mm. to go back there again this year or in any time in yeah. the near future. I've not been since 2001. So, <clears throat> yes. So I was kind okay. of like, with trepidation, I was like, what the act were? yes, I can tell you. So in 1998, I went to see the full lineup is, I'll start from the from the start uh, with 1998. It was Finley Quay, Junkster, James of Sit Down fame, The Seahorses featuring John Squires from... Um, uh, Stone Roses, Robbie Williams doing uh, Millennium and his big like solo kind of uh, arrival next year. He came back in 1999 and actually headlined the whole thing. Uh, special guests. I'm so sorry to interrupt you, Niall. It's speaking of special guests. Um, Harry is currently bringing me an nice. ice cream. So I just wanted to explain what the noise was. Thank you. Everyone say thank you, Thanks, Harry. Harry. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, special guests were Manic Street Preachers, which is why I was probably there. I loved Manix at the time. And then I also loved the headliner, which was with the Verve uh, that was around uh, Urban Hymns time. So, uh, very much like end of Brit Pop yeah. era, kind of thought this band were class, was, had missed Oasis a few years previous, but had seen Oasis in. Um, well, not the Aviva, but Lansdowne Road, as it was called then. And then three years later, I actually went to see the U2 Elevation Tour and uh, 
Yeah, oh. uh, I don't remember why. I just was like, oh, we should go because you two are you two, and like, you know, I don't regret it. Class. I don't regret it at all. It was great. <laughs> um, they were brilliant on the night. But looking at the lineup, I don't remember this. I don't remember Coldplay played apparently. Uh, Red Hot Chili oh. Peppers. I remember them playing because they played uh, Higher Ground, and they just were left a big impression because they were such a good live band. Uh, Relish played. Mm. Kelis played. I don't remember her playing. And JJ72, which I was a big fan of at the time. Um, and, and then I realized, I was just looking on Wikipedia today, a second gig took place a week later with U2 playing a headline. And I think you'd be a bit like yeah. annoyed if you picked this. Like, so, so you, okay. So the first one, 25th of August 2001, had uh, U2, Khalees, Coldplay, Red Hot Chili Peppers, and JJ72. The second one, the 1st of September 2001, had Moby, Ash, replacing Foo Fighters, Nelly Furtado, The Walls, Dara, and U2. So not quite as like right. long lasting perhaps, but uh, and certainly Ash replacing Foo Fighters. I can't remember why that was. Maybe it was illness or whatever it was at that point. But Moby with Ardell O'Hanlon. Uh, That's the... what it says. Moby with Ardell yeah. O'Hanlon. I don't remember that. <laughs> what? <laughs> what? Um, so the year with uh, the Mannix and... Um, Robbie and the Verve. Am I right in thinking that it was sort of generally uh, understood or the kind of sentiment at the time was that Robbie sort of played the Verve off the stage? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Like, and I was... Yeah. What do you remember of Robbie? Um, I remember how impressive he was. I remember how much of a showman he was. I remember how good the band were. I remember mm. how he played uh, Millennium and I was like, wow, that's amazing, that song. I was like... And then it became this mm. massive hit, or maybe it was just out at the time. I can't remember exactly, but yeah, it was it was a really like I went going being the indie rock kid, going oh can we see seahorses and mm. Max Street Preachers and the Verve, and kind of going hmm, Rob Williams is fucking brilliant. <laughs> this Robbie, <laughs> this Robbie Williams, Williams guy, guy he will go far. He's got a future ahead. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, really good. And I remember the yeah. U2 gig being particularly good as well. Um, a few years later, so but I do remember it. The pain in the arse. And it is kind of, when I think of Slain, I think of it as kind of the classic. It's the first uh, rite of passage for a lot of people. I think of uh, yeah. shitty dehydrated uh, hamburgers with a sliver of um, <laughs> some some weird uh, processed cheese and a, a, do- a very small dry dollop of tomato ketchup and one of those old burger oh buns. You know, you know the you know the burger van I'm thinking of. It's red and white and it's uh, long and you really don't and the chips are overly yeah. salty because they want you to drink more booze. And uh getting out was one of I think the year in t- nineteen ninety eight we lost a friend oh. of mine uh afterwards in the crowd and ended up by a service station, a petrol station, um for about six hours with one of my friend's dads. Like, obviously no mobile phones at that point. Waiting for him to turn up from somewhere. Couldn't obviously leave Slane without him. <laughs> just sitting in a car. We we went to the designated point. He never arrived. About four or five in the morning, like, like what? The gig finishes at 11. Yeah. Uh, he arrived um, having been picked up by the guards and brought to the local guard station. Even though he knew where this point was supposed to be. Anyway, the guards wouldn't let him because he was 16 or something. They wouldn't let him uh, go on his own. Oh, so uh, basically, that's what. Because you have to, obviously, you know now, you have to wait for all the traffic to leave before you can come back up. Oh, and if I you, know. And if you're walking, oh, I know you now. have to walk fucking ages. So you can just actually end up walking through the town. I think the thing about Slane is it, it suited its purpose many, 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 many years ago. Now it's got the nostalgia, mm-hmm. cool um, indie, not indie factor, but like a big headliner factor. Um, but mm. there are, I mean, it is a very small bottleneck around uh, the Slane Castle itself. You're coming from Dublin, the Dublin yeah. side. It's very much like there's that bridge over and there's just a traffic at a standstill that I remember. Now, you can tell me yeah. what it was like this year for Harry Styles. Sure. Um, so, yeah, so if you like a lot of things that you mentioned there haven't changed. Um, the food is uh not great um you know we got uh nadia and i's uh shared a like a a meal deal from burger van so she had a burger i had like what amounted to maybe like six little chips um and we got like a bottle of water and it was uh 16.99 
which, you know, we both nearly fainted. Um, yeah, we arrived in, it was kind of drizzly, which was unfortunate. And it just, it felt a bit miserable. I, like as soon as I walked in, Annie Mack was on the stage. She was playing Gimme, Gimme, Gimme. And I was like, here we go. And, you know, you've had that long walk to, to actually get to the to, to get to the place where the gig is on, which I didn't mind, actually, because um, it was a really nice atmosphere. Um, kind of just all the like families and like groups of girls just all excited for Harry. Feather boas everywhere. It was it was actually a nice enough walk. Um, but yeah, I arrived in and it was only then that I sort of took in the amount of people that were there. And when I say you couldn't move, like at the back where the food is, where, you know, it everywhere was jammed, like 80,000 people, my eye, like any, and anyone I spoke to there was saying like, there's no way this is 80,000 people. I've been to Slane, like at this gig, that gig, blah, blah, blah. This is the busiest I've ever seen it. I was like, right. Okay. So we sort of, yeah. So I think the crowd was a big factor, like the the type of people that were there, which was like vast, vast majority of women, I'd say like 80 to 85 percent were girls um, and the 20 to 25 percent of men that were there were either dads or boyfriends or like gay guys. Like there was no macho element at this gig. And that was such a it was such a different atmosphere to like music festivals or because it feels like a music festival when you're there. It's kind of designed to feel like a music festival. Um, and it was such a different environment and it was, it was so lovely for it. Like it was a very wholesome sort of just, everyone's just so excited. Like I spoke to a few families who were bringing their daughters to their first gig. You know, there was a few people, it was their first slain like myself but it it also it did feel very very crowded. If I'd brought a child with me, I probably would have regretted it. Um, in terms of the wait for Harry to come on. Um, so the support acts were Annie Mac, as I said, as we were walking in, she played some great tunes, which kept us company while we were queuing for the for the burger van. Then there was, oh, we missed um, one of Harry's, uh, one of the members of Harry's band. I can't remember his name now, but he played before Annie Mac. Um, and then Wet Leg were on, who were great. Um, we sort of heard them while we were queuing for the bar. <laughs> <laughs> Just, um, they, I think in the Garda press conference uh, in the lead up to Slane, they said that they were serving less alcohol at this Slane than previous ones. And I can understand why they would do that, but also like women drink alcohol too. And, <laughs> you know, it's not all families bringing their kids. They could have done with one more bar, I'd say. So yeah, I heard a bit of wet leg. They were really good, re uh, like a really good command of the crowd. Uh, they had this thing where they do this scream yeah. so that everyone can get all their negative energy out. But we didn't quite hear that that's what was <laughs> happening so we we're just chatting in the bar and then all of a sudden there's like eighty thousand people screaming and we were like what's going on <laughs> but it was yeah it was really good and then inhaler were on who were also really good to be fair yeah. i i think i have like a little soft spot <laughs> really? for inhaler. i feel like if i was 15 I'd really like them. Like they'd be, they'd be my cool little band or whatever. And they seem to really have a lot of fans. Yeah, they do. Well, you know, um, do you see their latest gig announcement? Three arena. Yeah, three arena. Yeah, so, I mean. Is it two nights they're doing? Yeah, I just saw one. I think I saw something about them doing two nights. So but missed it a bit. But yeah, November. Uh, I mean. Blossoms and so Crazy. Yeah, mad. Yeah, a lot of inhaler like merchandise, people like young, young girls, like kind of teenage girls between 15 and 18 wearing like inhaler T-shirts Um, people buying inhaler merch there. Which I'm is glad really it cool. makes sense to me now. Um, I'm, like, I'm like, who's listening to inhaler? It's young kids. All right. Grand. The kiddos. That's, yeah, yeah, yeah. The it kids. just helps yeah, me yeah, yeah. understand a bit more. Yeah, all, all the teen girls fancy uh, Bono's son, which I think is really yeah. cute because <laughs> it must be like like their moms remembering that they fancied Bono back in the day or they thought he was really cool or whatever. So I think, yeah, there's a, there's a kind of a cute legacy there. So, yeah, so we sort of stayed like on the hill uh, for anyone that doesn't know Slane is, you know, it's it's always referred to as this natural amphitheater. So the, the stage is at the bottom of this hill that kind of, you know, 
com- comes up in like a kind of a semicircle around the front of it. And then behind it is just the most beautiful like trees and like just this gorgeous um setting for this stage like it looked so so beautiful and then you had the castle over on the right as well um and it was great and so we sort of we sort of hung back on the hill a bit we didn't want to go down where things were too like squished and crowded and I think the sound wasn't great where we were on the hill like it, it, like we were, we, we had been in kind of two different spots. We'd been further down, and then we had to go to the bathroom, and then we came back, um, and we we stayed up a, bit, a little bit further back. So for the kind of more acoustic songs, um, the sound wasn't that great. But for the more kind of like the louder, more upbeat songs, the sound was was fine. It was grand. And then with the screens behind Harry, we kind of like stylized stuff, but also him on mm. the screens. And then you just screen either side. Uh, for people that are far back to look at that just follows Harry. Um, and I mean, yeah, I mean, I should talk about how Harry did. He was amazing. Like he was like, whatever my expectations were going into it, like he just, he really rose to meet that stage. You could tell from how he was talking about being there that he knew and understood that playing Slane is like a landmark in your yeah. career that it's important and that it's important to Irish people as well um and his band were fantastic he was quite funny he did his three bananas for a pound two bananas for a euro thing which yeah was I saw like something a, about what was he, that about so back when One Direction were doing a some kind of like radio interview tour or whatever, whenever the X Factor was over. There was an interview, I think it was him and Niall, and I think it was maybe on like, uh, it, it was on some radio station. I'm not sure if it was in Ireland or, or, or in the UK, but um, it was him and Niall, and Niall had taught him like three bana- or two bananas for a pound, three bananas for a yordo in that accent. And he did it on that radio station like, what, 12 years ago or whatever. But there was two girls right there in the front dressed up as bananas and and he pointed at them and then did it. So anyone who was like a One Direction fan back in the day was just like, oh, we've come full circle. He shouted out Mullingar. He was like, sing it out for Mullingar. He played a medley of three One Direction songs. Uh, he played Best Song Ever, What Makes You Beautiful and another one, which was just like, like Nadia and I burst into tears. Like we were, we were in bits during that bit. It was just so lovely and wholesome. Um, a few dads around me started to get into it at that stage. They were like, oh yeah, I know these songs. These are good songs. I've heard this playing out of my daughter's bedroom. I like this. <laughs> but like he was just so, he was amazing. Like we couldn't see him. Like we were watching the screens and he was just, he was wearing a glittery jacket. So he was just this like little piece of glitter that would occasionally like move around the stage and we'd be like, there he is, <laughs> um, which was great. So, yeah, the show itself was was fantastic. And there was a sign on the way in. Someone else took a photo of it. I didn't see it. That said something like um, by by coming into the uh, by coming into this venue, you um what do you call it? Like you, you give your permission for the artist to like film you or whatever. And so I have my hopes up that it was filmed for like a kind of a concert film or something. Or some people have been spec, some like Harry fans have been speculating online that he's making like a tour uh, film uh, of the um, Love on Tour tour. So I imagine we'd feature quite prominently he did he played Wembley then um so I think Slane was his bigger biggest ever gig and then when he played Wembley that topped it and it was like only two days later um which I'm annoyed about <laughs> but you know you win some you lose some uh so that was the show but yeah okay so the best of times the worst of times is Slane like I and I, and I don't want to like complain but like uh there's just a lot about it that like small tweaks and it could make the experience so, so much better. Um, one is, as I wrote in my in my newsletter, the plastic cups, guys, like, I'm sorry, but you 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 can't be you can't still be serving people plastic cups uh, at a gig that size. Like it is irresponsible. It's unethical. 
It's hor- horrible for the environment and, and also just for the immediate environment. Like we arrived in at four, half four, and the place was already covered. Like the ground was already covered in those like horrible plastic puffs just being like stomped into the earth. It was horrendous. There weren't enough bins as well. And there was no kind of like even attempt to encourage people to recycle any plastic. You couldn't bring in your own reusable bottle. So what's the point in having the refillable banks? Um, if I tried to throw my chili bottle at Harry from where I was standing, you know, they'd give me an Olympic gold medal if I had hit him. You know, like there's no there's no safety issue for the for the performer for me, yeah. like ha- having this with me. Um, so little things like that. Also, like the the price of the food, the fact that you're not technically allowed to have food. Um, to like, did bring you bring your sandwiches on the way down? Day you your, that's what I want. To, that's what we all want to know. Oh yeah, I brought my sandwiches on the way down. Had my little sandwich, and and I had a big breakfast before I left. So it's very very <laughs> responsible. But yeah, and and in the Irish Times, not in the review of it, but there was another there was another piece that was written in the Irish Times, um, in which the reporter was talking to a woman who had like a big picnic blanket and she'd managed to bring in, I think like feta cheese and like crackers and stuff. So I was like, okay, it it can be done. (laughs) So I'll bear that in mind if I ever go to Slane again. But then yeah, leaving was like the walk through Slane village was amazing. And the walk past, like, you know, the kind of residential area and the houses that you walk past. So the fi- they, they had like the fireworks going off, like for basically the, the whole time we were walking, they were, they were doing like a fireworks show. Everybody who lives in the residential area were like out on their, in their front garden, sitting on chairs and like waving at us. And like the atmosphere and the environment leaving was so, so lovely until we got to the car park. <laughs> <laughs> the car park now it was uh what's that thing lord of the flies <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> we wanted to get a bus right and the buses have sold out and you know that's that's another issue you can't encourage people to take public transport if there aren't if there isn't enough public transport that's not necessarily like solely the responsibility of the organizers but you know there's a conversation to be had there about like providing enough access for people to make like ethical climate decisions when it comes to getting to and from gigs, especially when they're far away and there's no other way of getting there. But um, so we got dropped off and picked up. Um, dropping off was a nightmare because there was no signs anywhere and we just had to keep like stopping on the road and asking other cars where they were going. And then eventually we had like a convoy of cars who were following us and we didn't know where we were going. And we were like hanging out the window and being like, what did that guard say to you? And then someone else would come along and be like, no, you can't go down this road. We tried that road and they said to go this way. So it was like, it was madness, but like a bit of fun. But on the way out, it was like, it took us so long to, um, for the person that was picking us up to actually get into the car park. Uh, He was on the other side of a hedge um, and he had to drive around, which took him an hour and 15 minutes to get into the car park. Um, but whereas if we just walked outside the little exit, we could have got into the car and left, but they weren't letting anyone leave. There was a family there who had a child with them who lived three doors down from that exit, but weren't allowed to leave that exit on foot because it was too dangerous. The guardie told them, but they'd entered that way on foot and nobody told them that they couldn't get back out. So they were like, what are we supposed to do? How are we supposed to get home? Uh, and, and they were like, oh, you'll have to get someone to come and pick you up. And they were like, there is no one to pick us up. So I, I I saw them asking people in cars to just drop them, you know, like 300 meters down the road. And they eventually got like a, a man who had enough room in a kind of like a minibus. Um, and he brought them out. But like madness, like, and then, you know, the way you have like lanes in a car park that you can like drive on, uh, or, like around the spaces. But like the only thing that was like showing you that these were the lanes to drive on were the cars that were parked. But when those cars leave the car park, there's no, there's nothing. So then you have like, and I'm not even joking, like 12, 13 lanes of traffic all converging on this one exit that had this like, these like two guys (laughs) at the exit trying to like manage all of this and all trying to get out the same way. It took us, we arrived at the car park Gig ended at half 10, arrived at the car park, maybe 10 past 11. We got out of the car park at 20 past one. Um, And then once we were out, 
it was like there was no traffic on the way it was fine um but it was it was hell <laughs> we were very lucky because like it wasn't raining it was it was pretty warm until like 1 a.m and then it suddenly got quite cold and people started to get like quite annoyed then um but it was yeah it was hell it was awful it is hard to get that amount of people out sorry go on. yeah i went to twitter like uh, to see if people were talking about the car park and there was like a few people talking about it but then i realized like nobody has any service there so no one's like online giving out about it because like we can't even make phone calls there let alone or like it's very very patchy uh let alone go on twitter and complain about it but yeah it was like like i said best of times worst of times i don't think i'd go to slain again like there was so much about it that i loved um like like I said, I really enjoyed the walk there and back. A lot of people hated it. I thought it was lovely. It was a nice kind of, it was, it was nice to kind of take a half an hour to 40 minutes to walk with your pal and talk about the gig and talk about the day. And yeah, I remember that walk being very nice. Yeah. It was lovely. It was really nice, especially going through the village and like chatting with the locals and they're kind of in the spirit of it and everything. And the fireworks are going off. Like it was beautiful. It was really, really lovely. But I think the overcrowding was a major major factor in me like probably not going again um like my biggest upside was the crowd the crowd were incredible like everyone was just really nice to each other everyone was helping each other I swore to myself that I wouldn't go for like a boy gig (laughs) as I described it to Harry I was like I love the Arctic Monkeys for example like hell would I go to Slane if the Arctic Monkeys were playing or like any sort of like like band that would draw a more laddish crowd just because it's so packed and it's such a long day and it's like yeah I don't know I just don't think it's planned very well even though they have like the beauty of the site and the legacy of the site of the site and all these things there's just little things they could do to make it a much more enjoyable experience and if they do want to open it up and make it more of a family event then they should do things like allow you to, you know, like bring in your supplies for the day. I absolutely understand not being allowed to bring in alcohol. Like I'm not saying anything like that, but, you know, your little sandwiches and, you know, and like just just little things that make it feel more like you're not having yourself shaken down after paying 97 quid for the ticket. Uh, and then going in and just being like oh, okay so if I want like just like basic stuff this is all very very mm. expensive kind of stuff so so yeah that's that still was the kind of general vibe it was beautiful I'd probably go again if like I was thinking about like who would have to play for me to go again and I reckon it would be one of one of the two Pauls um being uh McCartney or Simon um and other than that, I don't think, no matter how much I love the person, I don't think it will be worth the crowd being as sort of unorganized and free for all. There was also a real, I, I know that safe gigs Ireland were there. Um, I didn't see any, what, anyone around what, while I was there. They wear the pink high yeah. uh, jackets and you can report things to them. They're like, they're, they're like a safe space and a person if there's any instances of harassment or if you're feeling panicked anything like that at all you can go and talk to safe gigs ireland who are amazing they do brilliant work but there was a real lack of like a presence in terms of security or paramedics like there was a girl while we were queuing for food who fainted and there was a paramedic maybe like 200 people away from us and they couldn't get through to us so there was there was another woman thankfully who was a doctor and she came over and was helping the girl and she was just uh, she was dehydrated and it was just the heat um and the crowd and and she was fine then but the fact that paramedics couldn't get through the crowd was an issue for me so there was there was a lack of presence of like organizers or security and things like that that I feel like it just made me a little bit uneasy given how many children were there the size of the crowd the fact that it's a long day 
that that sort of thing made me a bit uneasy. And Nadia and I were talking about all these kinds of things while we were there, and we were like, "God, we're old!" Like, <laughs> if we were if we were twenty or twenty one, like my, like would we be looking out for like we'd probably be looking out for security guards, but for like completely different reasons. <laughs> but now we're like, it's very lack of security. It's very busy, very busy. <laughs> um, but yeah, that's the that's the vibe yeah. report on on Harry Styles. It's late. Well, thanks. Best I, of time I mean, for yeah, like I said, I mean, it's been so long since I went to a single concert of eighty thousand people or anywhere close to it. It's impossible mm. to even imagine it now. I mean, they obviously used to do it all the time. I couldn't imagine. It. I mean, the, yeah. I'm going to see the Prodigy soon for the crack uh, in a couple of weeks. Where are they playing? Fairview Park. It's not big. But then I've seen the, the gigs from St. Anne's Park. I've heard mixed reports, but that's all pulp last week. No, mm. I didn't go. Friends went and said, even getting in and out of there is kind of uh, a pain in the arse. I'm not sure if I want to yeah. do, like, I'm just not in that mode anymore. And that's fine. Um, and I'd, I'd kind of forgotten what a big gig. Yeah, I like. mean, it can be fun. Like, to me, the three arena is a really big gig yeah. these days. And I mostly sit when I'm there. Like, I'm not usually down on the, on the <laughs> I guess, floor, you know, like. and the other thing about what you mentioned earlier about the, um, you know, lack of facilities because it's a one and done day. A lot of that is just not set up because, mm. you know, you're, you're, you go to one spot or you stick around one spot and you throw your stuff in the ground. It all gets cleared up afterwards and that's it. And, you know, I mean, fair point about yeah not plastic but yeah anything else i mean like not garden recycling kind of mm. should be done um but yeah um mm. it is the big gig uh mm. it's kind of nice that it's still going but it's kind of mad that it you know mm. <laughs> it still has the same problems as it always has um yeah oh and just just one one last thing on it every single person who we met like you know checking your ticket or searching your bag or anything like that were like as excited if not more excited to be there than the people who were attending they were like amazing they were like part of the vibe they were part of the buzz they were so so nice really helpful the security men and like you know pe people that are kind of like guiding you in your directions or just there like on the long walk up they'd be like just 10 more minutes to go girls like keep going and like they're like supporting you like to, in your like pilgrimage to slain and that was a really big part of like how, like how much I enjoyed the walk up. <laughs> they were, uh, yeah, they were so into it. Like they, they were so, so lovely. And yeah, just everyone was just like on the rifles. And I loved that. I really, really loved that. And I hope all the kiddos that went had a good time. Actually, if, if anyone's listening who brought um, a young person to Slane this year to see Harry, I'd love to hear from you on the email or on twitter or whatever because I'm, I'm really interested in like what the perspective of a of a parent was or like if you're if your child had a good day if they enjoyed the experience and yeah that's podcast at .com and, yeah. if you want to email us uh, any thoughts yes, on that please. Um, you mentioned uh, sir paul mccartney there um did you see the uh any uh, headlines about him this week um I'm sure no. the Beatles. because we we had did an ai episode recently Obviously, I think the AI stuff is kind of like settled down a bit in the way that, you know, it's nice not to hear about it right now. Um, but, you know, it continues mm -hmm. to be happening in the background and um, the initial fervor about it all is kind of died down. But, uh, yeah, apparently they, uh, there might be a new Beatles um, song this year because of mm. AI technology. I mean... Technology has allowed nope. um, them to extract a vocal take from uh, John Lennon from an old demo and possibly will be turning that into a release of one Beatles song. This is what Paul McCartney told BBC this week. Um, he's uh, talking to the BBC. He said, well, it's a very interesting thing. It's something we're all tackling at the moment, trying to deal with what, what it means in terms of AI. I don't hear that much because I'm not on the internet that much. Fair play to you. But people will say to me, oh, yeah, there's a track where John's singing one of my songs and it isn't. It's just AI. So all that is kind of scary but exciting because it's the future. You can't tell. I'm sorry, but like his friend, that's his friend who died in extremely tragic circumstances. You can't be like, here's an audio recording of your friend who died. And then him being like, oh, it's just AI. That's so cruel. <laughs> like, no, stop it. Stop it. Let people live. Like, leave Paul alone. Paul does not need to grapple with the ethics of AI. He is in his 80s. He was a Beatle. Well, Leave he goes alone. on to say, Just I mean, in terms it. of like uh, get back, uh, Peter Jackson used some sort of uh, AI technology to extract um, some of the uh, vocals from a cassette. So 
he has familiarity with them mm. uh, and so understands the principle of it. But so he says, so when we came to make what would be the last Beatles record. It was a demo that John had that we worked on. We just we had just finished it up. It will be released this year. We were able to take John's voice and get it pure through this AI so that we could mix the record so that you would normally do. People say it's a song called Now and Then that was originally recorded in 1978. But yeah, mm. Sir Paul, another another Beatles song is going to appear at some point this year. So that's kind of uh, the vibe yeah. there. Well, I mean, I guess, you know, I'm thinking of Paul McCartney, uh, you know, the old man, but also like Paul was very much an early adopter um, back in the 60s and in the 70s of like new music technologies and stuff. And so if if it is something that he wants to explore, then fair enough. But also not needed. Like, but anyway, yeah. yeah, not needed. And also, yeah, there's a discomfort there with using yeah. AI to kind of fill in the blanks, as it were, with somebody who's passed. You know, it's yeah, it's a bit yeah. strange. And, uh, speaking of filling in the blanks, we talked recently about the Ed Sheeran copyright case where um, his song was mm. um well, he he uh, he was successful in that case where he was uh, up against the a uh, song from Marvin Gaye's estate, uh, "Let's Get It On," accused of uh, basically copying it. And uh, the thing about it is, it's uh, there's a really good New Yorker article that I want to recommend because I think if you haven't read it, you should. A case for and against Ed Sheeran, and um, the song it goes into de- depth about how that actually worked in terms of the court case, which I thought was um, mm. absolutely fascinating. Thinking out loud is the Ed Sheeran song. It talks about recording it and releasing it and, uh, you know, the similarities and also the difficulties in which it takes to uh, bring a song, bring a copyright case to court and how that works. So two things that I, 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 I would recommend and that I took away from this Um Firstly, uh, Ed Sheeran uh, missed his grandmother's own funeral to testify at this court case. That's number he one. Did, yeah. um, and a curious thing, because of the way that copyright law works, uh, the defense couldn't use the original Marvin Gaye recording of uh, Let's Get It On, but only approximate MIDI versions with a robotic voice. <laughs> it was so weird. So here's here's the bit. What? Here's the bit from it. In both the, so it talks about the Blurred Lines case and Stairway to Heaven cases. Uh in both Blur Lines and Stairway to Heaven cases, the jury was not permitted to listen to any pre-1978 recording. So there's a rule, basically, any song before 1978 cannot be played as a recording because the copyright is actually tied to the uh, written composition. But any song after January 1st, 1978, uh, uh, sound recording are admissible in court. So you had this sit- weird situation where Ed Sheeran's song could be played as is, but the Marvin Gaye song in court could not be played for the jury. So, but that completely removes the the concept of like timbre. Yeah. From so copyright. listen to this, right? That's that's so crazy. the jury had to rely on five pages of sheet music for "Let's Get It On," a skeletal transcription that contains lyrics, melodies, chords, and a notation of where the syncopated beats fall. Gaye's piano and the Funk Brothers' addition to the grooves, such as the bass line, weren't on the deposit copy. Uh, Gay, who didn't read music, probably never even saw the transcription. Sharon can't read music either. A fact that he readily yeah. admits on the stand. The only versions of uh, uh, Let's Get It On that the jury were, could listen to were the experts' MIDI audio files, which were made from the sheet music using musical software and sung by a computer-generated voice. The tinny weedle sound of the synthesized music and the high-pitched Android vocal made a classic soul song sound utterly soulless. I was like, I was trying to find a recording of that because I just really wanted to hear it. I was like, I want I want to hear what the uh, chord version of that is. I want to hear it. Um, Mar- Marvin Gaye, let's get it on court yeah. version. <laughs> I mean, could you just imagine? But you know, you know what else is 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 kind of that really bothers me about that. Actually, is is the fact that they use sheet music at all bothers me. Um, this is a jury of people who most likely do not read sheet music. It's two artists who don't read sheet music, and yet in musicology. In certain strands of in in most strands of musicology, there is a a priority given to the written the idea of the written music and the score as being the music itself yeah. that I've always like rubbed up against and and there's lots and lots of musicologists like that's a, that's a very contested idea in musicology yeah. um that the that the score is music and so to provide scores 
as the music and not also talk about and like to to remove things like timbre to remove like the bass line to remove other elements of music that kind of lay people and people who aren't musicians or aren't musicologists uh, like think of as music is to kind of intellectualize it in a way that can be very very confusing very alienating and doesn't actually reflect how music kind of functions for everyday people and that's the point of this copyright lawsuit it's that you know oh when people hear this they'll think it's but it's 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 completely ignoring how how music functions yeah. in people's lives and just intellectualizing it to to this to this space where people are going to go oh yeah well that that does look like it's the same melody and that's not that's not fair yeah enough. john john seabrook's new yorker piece about this does make it clear that uh, well yeah maybe there is an actual issue with using uh, sheet music and also that sheet music is my, mainly applies to um classical music and doesn't actually serve uh, modern r and and so on uh, black root music essentially but also yeah. says that you know yeah. in music copyright trials the way this works is two kinds of people expert listeners like musicologists and then lay ones um decide how it works it's called mm. the arnstein test so a really interesting uh, article if you want to read that i think it's uh it's from the music issue from uh, a couple of weeks ago uh, a week or so ago uh, really good piece interactive um bits with the songs there as well so you can hear some of the uh, things I think it's just really interesting. Um, how drop the MIDI yeah, version, I guys. I was I was <laughs> hoping I could find it so I could play it. I was just like, this would be hilarious to, to hear this. this <laughs> There's probably some software we could run it through, but also you know the ethics of that are probably yeah yeah yeah. yeah. But look, I was just trying to find out. That'd be fun to to hear that. Um, yeah. So yeah, yeah, and. Uh, Speaking of things I read this week, and I have to give a shout out to Hot Press, who actually wrote something very interesting this week <laughs> about uh, the cost of uh, rising cost of touring in the US. There was a piece by Sandra Black uh, in hotpress.com this week. Uh, talks about how, no, no, I'd heard about this before, but it's a good place that lays it out. Um, so we, we've been talking a lot about um, the co- rising cost of touring. And, you know, when we talked about it before, it's a combination of... Uh, Inflation, cost of living, um, Brexit, all these other things that are affecting it. But, um, you know, and there's a lot of, there's a lot of talk in our Discord, if you're interested in joining that, like it's it's patreon.com forward slash 909, um, and join our community there. Um, but it was talking about, say, the PJ Harvey um, tickets for this week, which were mm. going about 70 quid plus for the Olympia. And it was point was made that uh, based off inflation, it's actually not that much more than the last time she played was like 16 years ago in the same venue. Mm. But here's an example of something that could be really negative and it could affect all of us in terms of the bands we are going to go see um, and the bands that will uh, be able to leave this country, um, which is obviously, you know, we're a small island. We, uh, bands need to travel to in order to make a living. Um, but what bands like yeah, Inhaler. And, uh, so <laughs> so uh, the U.S. Department of Homeland have uh, uh propose a significant hike in the fees to be paid for touring visas it's called a p visa i remember having a chat with somebody recently about this uh they are currently cost 460 dollars per person uh but the proposal will put this up to 1615 uh per person meaning that just to get over there with a group of four people you're talking about 1600 by four uh so it's a 260 percent in increase of the cost which would you just mean what a, like people won't be able to afford to go to tour and play in the US at all. And then there's talk then that, uh, you know, uh, the European uh, authorities will respond tit for tat and kind of uh, introduce uh, visas for US because because um, they've done it to us. So it could mean that like US bands mm-hmm. won't be able to tour here. The kind of bands that you would hope to see. Uh, in the workman's club will will not be visiting here so it's kind of, kind of all like falling apart in a way like like international touring has been mm. falling apart for for a couple of years now but now it's just and really... what what is the like what's the justification for, for them the US they say it's the um uh, over uh staff shortages and stuff like that is the main reason high demand combination of high demand and sh- staff shortages um and they i think this is kind of like Sorry, in in the visa office in the U.S. Uh, uh, citizen and immigration department in the in the homeland. Yeah. Um, right. So you say they are trying to work reduce the workload, but uh, 
but essentially that means like you're making it less viable for artists therefore making less work for yourself um so mm. you could get into this weird zone where like the only people that are playing countries are the people who live near it and you'll never have unless you're massive like yeah. um you know obviously beyonce is taking a massive tour around the world at the moment um, people like Harry Styles will be able to here. do yeah but I mean that's it she maybe probably didn't do it because it, like we're a small island and there's lots of different uh, our cost of insurance is very high as well as, as of course that's another yeah. reason that's been touted by promoters here or why people aren't coming here um, so it does happen a lot uh, we haven't seen Rosalia come to Ireland yet for example um, anyway yeah. and then for for any artists that do travel to the US like they'll have to pass that cost on to well it just makes it makes it incredibly hard to do so i mean Mm. you're talking about putting up 15 grand easily plus depending on how many members uh you have in your band um i think the scratch uh manager is mentioned in this and uh, somebody's child keen god for me actually met keen at uh, great escape and had a brief chat with him about this and he said you know, it ended up um, costing them a lot of money just to get to South by Southwest because they got mm. the visas. Sometimes people just don't get the visas, just go because they can't afford to pay the. You're talking like yeah, and there's only fees so paid much to lawyers twenty like, twenty grand in, yeah twenty in twenty grand dollars uh, to get just to get over there to play one showcase. You know, it's a lot of money, and it's not something that most people have lying yeah. around. Like we've talked about streaming and you know how much little revenues comes from there. Where are bands on the way up trying to get over that precipice? Where how are they going to get twenty grand? Mm. Just kind of like yeah, no, I have this money. It's actually yeah. fine. Even even doing something like South by Southwest or you know these kind of the, the, these kind of uh, festivals or shows that can break you. Like if you don't have the money, like it's a it's a parity issue in terms of like you know musicians who have a bit of money who maybe come from more affluent backgrounds might be able to pay those things musicians who don't won't be able to pay that sort of money and are therefore kind of locked out of you know like major major opportunities yeah so it's Um, a it's one to watch and one to keep an eye on because i mean we still have there's no actual solution still in terms of like brexit what Mm. happens with the uh Irish bands going there, this kind of a, it's not being fully enforced, is what uh, Torsten from God of an Astronaut saying. That's back to tracks with everything else that have, we've heard from bands who go there and mm. bands who, well, they should uh, um, actually admit that they're bringing stuff over because you have to, it's this convoluted process where you have to uh, list all the equipment that you bring over and how much it costs and then they you have to give them money. I think Gilliband talked about it recently. It's, a minefield and it's a mindfuck and and mo- like for doing. artists who are moving within the european union has there been has there been a rise in costs for them like i mean the rising costs are the same as any other European just well? like cost of living and and transport just and general all that kind, kind of, of inflation yeah. and yeah. so now it's bad but definitely yeah. uh, easier uh, place to go than anywhere else at the moment so uh, yeah. definitely one to uh yeah keep an eye on uh, and another thing i wanted to mention before we go uh on this very summary podcast um is oh, yeah. uh the why not her report which came out um this week irish times piece about it from linda coogan burn and margaret e ward now why not her is a campaign basically looking at the uh gender disparity on radio play every year and every june they uh release a data report based off um what the radio stations are playing in terms of breakdown of gender and uh, further equality and uh, inclusivity um, categories. And so I'm just going to... Yeah, this year's is gender and ethnicity, yeah, isn't so, it? Yeah, um, so it's mm-hmm. basically compiles a report of the top 20 play, most play, uh, playlists and songs. Um, so here are some top line stuff that uh, from this year's Why Not Her report. Uh, this year's data reveals international acts and white male artists continue to dominate the airwaves. I think that's a big surprise to anyone. Only the nation's national broadcast, RT1, has booked the trend by consistently highlighting artists of both genders almost equally on its place over the four years. This is from the directly from the report. Uh, latest Why Not Her report um, shows that musicians uh, born or based in Ireland who are women or people of colour still get less airtime. Only 6% of the top 100 songs on Irish radio were by Irish female artists, including collaborations with male artists, down from 13% in 20, 
32. When you drill down to the top 20, things are even That's worse. A number of local radio stations have players that were between 95% and 100% dominated by white men. Last year, 2FM, uh, top, two times top 20 include 80% male artists, and this hasn't changed. More than 98% of the artists featured in the top 100 are already signed by big labels. But even if you're a female artist uh, represented by a big label, there's no guarantee you'll be treated equally in terms of radio time. An example here is in 2001, Mel May became the first Irish woman to release a number one album in the official Irish charts in five years with 11 past the hour. She received less than 100 plays across Irish radio the week she became number one in Ireland. Um, and then the following week, I think it was uh, Dermot Kennedy uh, got 10 times the amount of plays and knocked her off um, the top uh, album, uh, number one in the country in the, in the, in the Irish charts that, the following week. Yeah, so just some of the top line stuff. If you're looking for that, there is a, a article called Why Not Her? Um, you can see the breakdowns in terms of male and female and uh, how it works in terms of radio stations. You know, this is a perennial thing that seems to happen. Um, you know, I mean, somebody has to take responsibility for making this change because if you don't somebody doesn't make a change i think what seemed to happen is like when the report first came out a lot of radio stations kind of went oh yeah maybe we should do something about this and now they've kind of settled back into their uh 20 kind of buzz um which is very very low in some cases uh mm -hmm. 2fm 20 percent female uh rt radio 1 60 percent even rt pulse is 35 percent uh rt lyric fm 40 percent and there's a full canva thing obviously that's the national broadcaster which is where these kind of things should be easily done without uh commercial um issues uh clouding or are you being used as excuses and um, but yeah it's still not great in terms of what's been happening female artists in terms of today fm has been actually getting less the last couple of years it's it went from 15 to 5 to 10 i think that's what's especially disappointing about this no, is yeah, seeing radio stations downwards. that had improved yeah and it and it really shows that these kinds of conversations like the first the first one of these reports came out in 2020 and there was a major conversation had um you know on on social media but also it got a lot of media coverage and kind of mainstream media and then in 2021, there were a lot of stations that were seen to have made a major improvement. And then that that kind of trended again in, in, in 2022. But it just shows the importance of kind of continuing to have this conversation because L Linda could have done this report in 2020 and said, that's it. But I think it's really important that that sh she continues. And we all like, you know, me being in like research community and like journalists and ev everybody continues to kind of shine a light on this because if you're not keeping an eye on it then old habits will kind of slip back in and you mightn't even notice it yeah. you know so yeah it's yeah amazing i mean it's, Linda, it's good to see that they're still at the uh doing the report and like tracking what's been going on um but i guess the question is like um what what, what happens next i mean because it's Mm. These reports don't have a uh, a lasting impact on the actual stations, a, a temporary blip that mm -hmm. gets quickly discarded and back to business as usual. So, I mean, look, that's we as as we know, like commercial radio stations, especially, are um, not willing to take a risk, and they will say, you know, um, oh, they'll point to somebody like Jazzy that giving me song as the number one. It doesn't matter if it's a woman, uh, but you know, it's like somebody like RT actually really has to step up in this regard. And uh, it's not just like, mm. and they have been very good in terms of like supporting Irish music a lot lately. Um, but there just needs yeah. to be more of an actual, it's not a, you can't be like, oh, well, you actually have to platform this stuff. You actually have to do it to change it. You can't just be like, yeah. well, we played the Jazzy song because it was really popular. Like, it doesn't matter who this mm. person is or where that person is from or, or who they are or what gender they are. But it actually does because, as we know, it, just, yeah. it really matters. It really does change things when you can see it, you can be it, yeah. all that kind of stuff. It needs to be the kind of thing that just is uh, baked into, especially the, the national broadcaster. Um, so yeah, that's the mm -hmm. uh, perennial um, discussion about uh, radio <laughs> and uh, gender uh, yeah. parity or disparity. And uh, to close thing, our our yeah. annual discussion. And to close things <laughs> off, I mentioned Moby and Ardell O'Hanlon performed together at Slane. Yeah, so um, 
<laughs> that was because Moby was a massive fan of uh, Father Ted, of course, like anyone uh, with a brain would be. Uh, so apparently, um, Ardell mm-hmm. Hanlon did a, um, a Q&A in New York at a comedy festival once, and Moby turned up, and he, all he was doing was asking really nerdy questions about Father Ted. So the day of slaying, um, he asked him to come and play uh, My Lovely Horse and uh, come and sing it with him. And... Uh, Ardell was like, oh, I don't really want to do this because, uh, well, Ireland are playing Holland in the World Cup qualifier. So he's like, I don't really want to do it. I want to watch the match. Uh, <laughs> so um, yeah. uh, as soon as the match was over, um, Moby flew him down in a helicopter. And Dur- Dermot Morgan was I think so, yeah, stages, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. So he got up. He probably doesn't remember thinking about it. Uh, doesn't remember singing it. Uh, there's no video footage of it or anything like that. Uh, there's no recollection Aww. of it. There's no footage of it, he says. So, yeah. <laughs> So there you go, Moby and Ardell and Hanlon. So that's uh, that's our, our trip around the around the houses, our, our canter around the paddock this week. Yeah, that's it for most, I think, this week. I think we'll just leave it there. Yeah, and, uh, loosey goosey summer episode. It's like when when the teacher says you can go and do, we'll we'll do class outside. Yeah, today. I mean sometimes you need you need that kind of summer vibe at the moment. I think as well because it's so it's so I warm. Think so. so we'll be. We'll be dipping in and out of things, I think, in the next uh, few weeks and uh, see how we, we have some plans. But sure, look, we'll keep it loosey goosey yeah. for now. But yeah, if you yeah. want to support us, it's uh, patreon.com forward slash nine or nine. And come and join us on the Discord there. And um, Andrea, anything you'd like to add? You can follow my newsletter. I'm writing it again, which is fun and exciting. Um, Andrea dash cleary dot ghost dot io. Um, and I'll have like a full slain review uh, this weekend, I believe. No, that's great. It. I'm going to go to that's a couple of festivals me. this weekend. I'm at Body and Soul on Friday and Saturday, and then Beyond the Pale with Lumo on Sunday. I'm um, looking forward to that. Hopefully, weather will be good. Don't expect it. How was the boat? Oh party? yeah, we had a Lumo boat party. Yes. Uh, yeah, it was really fun. How it was, was really it? fun. Um, it was the day of slain. It was, it was yeah, devastated. Yeah. Um, it was a different vibe than last year. It was kind of a bit more relaxed. I think it was. Uh, people were just happy being there. It was less windy. Uh, less less like dancing indoors, which is fine. Um, it seems to fly mm. by. I'd love to make it longer. Uh, it was great fun though. It's a, yeah. it's a great thing to do. I, mean, I haven't done it before. Last year, um, it was nice to do it again. And does the SS Lumo allow you to bring your own sandwiches? Um, you could bring your own sandwiches, not just not your own booze. There was plenty of bottles of Prosecco bought. That's good on, enough on for board. Me. Um, so yeah, it is a great, it is a great uh, little uh, jaunt to do. Hopefully, we can do it again. Just gonna have to do it again next yeah. year. It, I, I mean, we'll say it's great fun, but it doesn't make us any money. <laughs> but it's fun to do. It's fun to no. But no. Yeah, yeah. It's it, it's also difficult for people touring around the waters of Ireland. <laughs> yeah, as well as trying to travel to America. <laughs> yeah. All right. Okay. That's it from us this week. We we'll talk to you later. That's the Lion Podcast. Bye. Talk to you soon. Bye.